back in the studio now for the Woodlawn Hospital Report. We've got COO Brad Rogers joining us. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you today, Paul? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. I'd be okay if it was a little bit warmer outside and no uh, snow flurries today, but otherwise I'm okay. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Christmas music uh, at all times of the year, so, you know, I may or may not play some this afternoon. <laughs> Well, uh, my co-host Randy this morning uh, starting to snow, and he walks out here and goes, "It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas." I'm like, "Nope, nope, stop, stop." Yeah, it's hard this time of year to think about that, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. So uh, Woodlawn has uh, had their meeting for the month, and uh, you're, you're going to go over some of that stuff with us. But uh, first, I wanted to ask you. Um, I know there's been a change with uh, Pulaski closing their delivery department. How has that affected Woodlawn Hospital? Um, you know, really our job is to just step in and help any you know local community hospital and, and just citizens of the community anytime we can. So when we knew that that was coming, our director of OB, um, Alyssa Morrison, stepped in, uh, set up some meetings with Pulaski Memorial uh, physicians and, and staff and really worked on and, and helped with a transition plan for those patients. Okay. Um, so our OBGYNs obviously jumped in and volunteered and said, look, we'll do whatever we can to help transition whatever care is requested of us. Um, so we've moved some of those patients um, over to our physicians and um, are doing some of those deliveries here um, and, and just help them any way we could. Okay, all right. Um, so what all happened at your uh, most recent meeting? Sure. Um, you know, the fun thing is always the financials, and yes. so we always go over those, and so I'll go through those quickly, and then we have a few other topics that we'll go through today. Okay. Um, admissions for the month, uh, we had 66 admissions. Uh, we had budgeted for 81. Um, however, then on the patient day side, we actually had more um, stays or uh, patient days than we budgeted for, um, up about 23% compared to the same time last year. So we had 336 patient days. Um, in which we had only budgeted for about 279. Oh, okay. Um, now with COVID, some of those length of stays tend to be a little right. longer, and so some of those things uh, account for that. Uh, we also had um, some swing bed stays, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, a few more days than we had projected on that as well. Okay. Um, we did have some areas that are down in volume. Surgeries were down uh, um, 120 procedures when we typically budgeted for around 166. Um, not unusual in January as particularly elective procedures involve people's uh, deductibles and copays, which roll over at the beginning of the year. Right. So sometimes that has an effect on that as well. Okay. Um, we were up in several areas too, though. Um, imaging areas continue to be strong. Laboratory services continue to be strong. ER visits um, exceeded budget uh, for the month quite a bit. And physician budgets all, uh, visits, although weren't at budget, they were about 9% above the same time again last year. Okay. So what we're starting to notice on each of the little individual areas is that there's just slow, steady, creeping upward, hopefully moving back to those pre-COVID days uh, um, visit-wise. Um, all of those things then will affect everything else as, we're, uh, you know, as we see more and more therapy visits will occur with more and more physician visits and such, so. All right. Yeah, uh, slowly creeping up in a lot of those areas. Yeah. Uh, for the month, Total patient revenue is about 13.4 million. You know, and then we have all those deductions, which are insurance contractuals and bad debt and all those things that come off of that. Uh, that was about 8.6 million. Total operating revenue for the month was about 4.8. Um, total operating expenses, um, 5.2. So looking at that, then you see about a $400,000 loss from operations. Um, however, with our other non-operating revenue of about 300,000, the loss for the month was only about $98,000. Okay. Um, still a loss and something that we're working on improving every day. Um, but as compared to last year, that was about a 64% improvement in Jan as compared to January of last year. Hey, that's great to hear. So slowly moving forward in the right direction in all those areas. Um, swing bed, I just talked about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, swing bed is a program that Woodlawn Hospital has, and we've had for many, many years. Um, it is a type of skilled stay, meaning uh, similar to a skilled nursing stay. Um, something we haven't really promoted a lot in the past, but uh, we want to make sure everybody understands. You know, if you have a 
surgical procedure performed in, in you know, Kokomo, Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, South Bend, and um, those providers are saying, hey, you may need to go into a long-term care setting for a short period of time to, to get some rehabilitation or to just get back to um, safely going home without any problems. Um, we have that program, and so that's something that we're going to start, um, you know, getting out there to the community a little bit more, letting those facilities know. You know, if you have a knee replacement or a hip replacement or, or any procedure for that matter at a, a, an alternate location, um, we can still bring you back into Woodlawn and help take care of those post-acute needs. Okay. Um, we are the only four-star or five-star facility historically anywhere in the area. Um, so, you know, you have all the things you would need right on site. You have imaging downstairs and laboratory downstairs and emergency room there and all the physicians right here in town to take care of you. So, yeah. um, if that's something you're interested in, please let us know or let your discharge planners know at the hospitals where you're located. Okay. So. All right. Um, other exciting news, um, IT. So IT is one of those things that uh, that always is in our in our mindset at the hospital. Every system we utilize, you know, we rely so heavily on our IT staff, and, and they're phenomenal. Um, our IT director Luke uh, uh, Gross has um, really worked hard in the last few months on interoperability. Okay. So the idea he's trying to get all of our systems to talk to each other easy, uh, more frequently and in a way that will reduce the amount of workload on the physicians and nurse practitioners, the nurses in the hospital, and really all of the Woodlawn staff. So he's made great strides in the last couple months in building some interfaces with our um, EHR companies um, to send information back and forth. Okay. And so that, that's extremely exciting for us. Yeah. It also is good for um, you know patient care and patient satisfaction. You know, patients won't necessarily have to bring a physical order from one provider. You know, at the maybe they're at our Argus location, they won't have to bring that physical order to the hospital and hand it to someone. It'll go through from system to system. Um, so it reduces the likelihood that you know you forget something, you don't have it with you. If there's questions about the order, we'll have that now in the system in a much easier manner. So, very nice to hear. Yes. And then, um, just a quick reminder before I get to our guest here, um, Red Cross, the national blood shortage. Um, we talked about it last month. Um, it is still very, very near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, so please get on redcross.org, um, look at the local uh, blood drives coming up. If you're able to give, please do. Um, we do have one coming up March 30th at Woodlawn Hospital from 2 to 6 p.m. And uh, you can go on redcross.org and sign up for that. Okay. So uh, any help that we can get throughout the state would be, would be amazing. Yeah, I know uh, the Fulton County Public Library has a blood draft coming up here shortly as well. Wonderful. They Absolutely. Were on yesterday and we were talking about the shortage as well because I remembered you saying that last month. And so we encourage people to get on and sign up for that one as well. And uh, definitely sign up for the Woodlawn one as well. Yeah, as many uh, people as we can get, it's, it's huge right now. We are on an allocation type system where we only get a certain fixed amount because of the shortage. And so uh, whatever we can do to help that supply throughout Indiana will help all the hospitals and all the communities. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And then last but obviously not least, uh, Don Gabrich is here with me today. Don is our Director of Accreditation and Regulatory Affairs. And Don's got a couple of exciting things, kind of to just go over. We've talked about them a little bit over the last uh, year or so, okay. um, but just an update on what we're doing with regards to stroke care and chest pain. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brian, and nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. Welcome. Thanks. So basically what I do, are, there's a couple different things. Um, the key components as far as patient care goes are um, we're pers we've pursued and have achieved our stroke ready certification. Um, and then also right now we're actively pursuing our chest pain center accreditation. So these are two um, programs that we put in place so that we can um, standardize our care. We can put in place national best standards for care for these patients that come through the door in whatever manner. Um, and then um, ultimately we improve their care. So the journey kind of for these programs started about two years ago. We've now been stroke ready certified for a year. It takes about a year to get each program in place. Um, but we've seen substantial improvement in, um, you know, a lot of it is about creating a sense of urgency, recognizing signs of stroke early on and responding really quickly. 
because we know that um, in both stroke and cardiac care that time is tissue, time is brain, time is muscle. And so the faster we can respond, the better outcome for our patients. So um, as far as stroke goes, um, we did in the last year, we had 120 patients come in that we um, assessed as um, concerns that they may be having a stroke. And so what we do is we have a team that responds immediately and we get them quickly to CT. And then we, um, we've partnered with a teleneurology group. Um, which is based in Fort Wayne, but also nationally. So that way, any time of day we can get on and within about 10 minutes, we can have a neurologist on a camera that is kind of this pretty cool cart that we can just wheel right in the room and they can interact with the patient with the help of the, the nurse or the staff in there. Um, and then they help to make recommendations as far as should we give them this clot busting drug? Do we need to send them off to have like a surgery um, where they can remove a clot that they may have. So, and then a lot of times they can also help us to determine, all right, is this patient safe to stay here? Is, you know, are their symptoms bad and, or not so bad? And we can keep them local, which is so important to our patients here in, in the area. If they're, or if they've had um, like what people call a mini stroke or, or a TIA, where they're resolving, they had some symptoms, but they're resolving, and we can keep them here and do the workup right here in house. So that's um, a big benefit to our patients. So um, as far as chest pain goes, um, we've also similarly, we do a lot of um, data collection. So, you know, we're timing things and we're watching how long is it taking us. Our goal for any patient coming in the door with chest pain is to have an EKG completed and read by a physician within 10 minutes of them walking in the front door. And we are increasingly meeting that goal. And that basically just helps us to identify are they having a heart attack because we can see that on that EKG? And if that's the case, our goal is to get them out the door within 30 minutes. So we partner with um, Lutheran EMS, Samaritan, we fly them as quickly as we can um, and get them to the cath lab so they can you know, restore the blood flow to the heart. So, um, so that's kind of the biggest thing there. Um, and then, you know, these programs we put in place, but you know, you don't just put them there and then you walk away. Right. Right, so we continually monitor, continuous improvement, um, action plans, anything we identify that, you know, we were one off on this month, then we're gonna put some actions in place so that we can help to address it moving forward. And that's where it's such a um, multidisciplinary team, especially at Woodlawn, we're small, but you know, we're kind of, we're mighty as far as it's so easy for me to, you know, just talk to the director of nursing or talk to the, you know, ER, talk to the physicians or the nurses on the front lines. Um, and say, how can we make this better? Let's work with the lab or the or radiology and you know, get this quicker so that we can treat the patient quicker. So, and then um, another key component to both of these programs is community education. So, um, you know, making sure that we help the community to know how to identify what a stroke is. You know, what are the symptoms of it? We use the acronym of BFAST, and I know we've talked about it before and um, even on the show, um, just identifying like is there a disruption in your balance um, are there you know is there something going on with your eyes where you're seeing double vision is there facial drooping um, arms is a so is there weakness in the arm it, and it could also be in the leg but is there weakness and um, typically on one side versus both sides where it's um, kind of global weakness and then speech slurred speech or um, you know, on, on occasion people will try to get the words out, but they won't quite come out or they'll come out as kind of nonsensical. So right. those are all symptoms. Um, and then the T for in BFAST is just it's time to call 911. And that's what we've really encouraged um, community to call 911. And um, because when EMS comes, they can start care immediately versus, you know, driving yourself in. Right. So, um, and so that's what really that's all about. And then with... Um, the early heart attack care is another component and we're just you know helping people understand that chest pain isn't just chest pain you know it may be kind of a feeling of, of fullness or indigestion shortness of breath some back pain shoulder pain jaw pain all of these are early signs and we just really want to encourage people to seek care if they start to notice that this is out of the ordinary for you um, that you know we can do some simple tests some you know blood tests do an EKG you know, maybe do a stress test and just see how's your heart operating and can you get ahead of this before you would have a heart attack. Okay. So, um, and we've done um, a health fair at the community center. Um, back in December, we're gonna do another one in the spring. 
um, where we you know do some blood pressure screenings and some education, some blood sugar, um, nutrition awareness, things like that. Um, yeah. So. Well, and I think the other one that that I'd like is um, to mention is you went down to the um, youth center. Yep, the outlet. The outlet, mm -hmm. and and you know you think about. Well, Boy, are we educating these little kids, and are, what are they going to be able to do with that information? And the truth is, we've had personal instances here in the community where it was the sixth grade uh, grandchild who called for their grandmother because they realized that they had had they were having a stroke. Yeah. So getting that out to different populations is, is huge. And the other thing I would say for Dawn when she was talking about, um, you know, the symptoms might not necessarily always make you think heart attack. Um, that's the reason why cardiovascular disease is the silent killer among females. Um, typically, ladies don't present with the same symptoms of crushing chest pain and, and arm pain and, and jaw pain that uh, many men do. So, um, you know, when in doubt, we need to get you calling to get some assistance right away. Absolutely, absolutely. So, very exciting stuff. I mean, all of these things are designed, and, and Don's been working really hard on those for, like she said, you know, a couple of years, um, as ways to make sure we just keep improving what we can do for the residents of Fulton County and surrounding areas. Yeah, lots um, of exciting things. Yeah. And, and it puts us at the forefront of, you know, partnering with outside uh, uh, entities like the uh, teleneurology, um, where we can have those services right here. Um, so that's just a, a great thing for the community. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I always say that there's always exciting things going on in Woodlawn, and Woodlawn's always moving forward. And each and every month when we sit down to do the hospital report, you always have more of what you're moving forward with. So. Yeah, it is a great place to work. And, and, you know, the nice thing is that the board has consistently supported the leadership of a hospital in anything we can do to improve the care for the community. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for thank taking time you. out of your day. And uh, Dawn, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for coming on to the radio for the first time. And Brad, we'll see you again next month. Sounds good. Thanks Sounds so good. Much. Thanks. Thank you, guys.